Major funding for this program was provided by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, the state affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Southern Educational Communications Association and the California Council for the Humanities, a state program of the National Endowment for the Humanities. You had to be here then to be able to don't see it and don't hear it now. But I was here then, and I don't see it now, and that's why I did it. I did it for them back there, buried under them trees. I did it because that tractor is getting closer and closer to that graveyard. And I was scared if I didn't do it, one day that tractor was going to come in there and plow up them graves, getting rid of all the proof that we ever was. As far back as anyone can remember, the fourth Sunday of the month has been the day of the sacrament at Mount Zion Baptist Church. The little wooden building sits just off Highway 1 in Point Coupee Parish, Louisiana. Fifty or sixty years ago, this church was filled with people on Sunday. Their singing and praying could be heard all the way up the plantation quarters and clear back to the cane fields. Living in cabins built by their slave ancestors, the people of River Lake Plantation worked and sweated in the fields for little pay, but they cared for each other fiercely, even as they struggled to survive. Now the church and the few remaining houses are slowly crumbling. When they are gone, there will be nothing left of this place, nothing but memories. Go a mile, a couple of miles back toward the swamps. You can go a quarter of a mile over, um, over in this direction. A half mile up here, another half mile over there. They worked all of this land, and the other people who are buried in here now. Uh, we used to live up here. The plantation quarters are just up the road here, a little piece up the way. That's where we lived, and. Uh, this is where we'll bury it. And this is where I, uh, where I hope to be uh, buried one day. For Ernest Gaines, this graveyard, where most of the graves are sunken and unmarked, is hallowed ground. Uh, the people I had in mind when I was doing the autobiography, Miss Jane Pittman, 
uh, the people I had in mind, doing, especially the gathering of old men, people I had in mind. The man to whom I ded uh, dedicated the book posthumously, he's buried over in this area. And Mr. Walter Zena, he's buried here. Others whom I had in mind when I was writing the book, they're all buried in here. I, you know, I used to write letters too for these people. Now he's saying these people, I mean for, for the people, he's write letters for them. For my aunt and for some of the old people. And um, that was the beginning of uh, understanding my place in the world and understanding them. Ernest Gaines remembers life on this plantation before the tractors came in and the people moved out. He remembers what he saw and heard, and he remembers what people told him. Although I've lived in California the last, uh, oh, 43 years or more, uh, I still write about this place here because uh, I, I just feel that those letters are not finished yet, and I doubt that I could ever finish them. If we don't keep a really good sense of the past, uh, we lose the only stabilizing force that we have, uh, w which is the memory that links us to the people who came before and to their lives. And so we have to know as much as we can about the past and how people dealt, how they, how they coped. Ernest Gaines's people have been at River Lake Plantation for over a century, dating back to slavery. To get here, you drive 35 miles west from Baton Rouge, across the Mississippi River, and through the lush farmland of Point Coupee Parish. At the little town of Oscar, you turn left off the highway and onto the road leading into the quarters. Built in the 1780s, the plantation was bought in 1895 by this man, Purvis Sherry Major. The sharecroppers who lived here called it Sherry Quarters, a double row of 30 cabins that lined the dirt road leading to the cane fields. They chopped cane, loaded it into mule-drawn wagons, and hauled it to the sugar house. In the plantation store, they spent script money, color-coded for people who could not read. Ernest Gaines's people were sharecroppers when he was born in this two-room cabin in 1933. Hard times for Louisiana and the rest of the country. Hadreen Jefferson Gaines was only 16 when her oldest child was born on January 15th, a Sunday. By the middle of the week, she was back at work in the fields. She and her husband, Manuel Gaines, named the boy Ernest James for his great-grandfather, James McVeigh. The road where we lived, the plantation place, uh, where the people lived were called, was called the quarters. Or we were quartered, I guess. If, if this was 50 years ago, you would find, uh, you would not find all of this, this, this shrubbery, all these trees here like this. You'd find houses here, and you'd find uh, yards, and you'd find some people had flowers, and uh, uh, you'd find a lot of children, and a lot of children would be playing in this road here. And those houses over there only got uh, electricity after, um, uh, after the war. Because I remember uh, studying by, uh, uh, studying my lesson by, um, by uh, kerosene lamps or by the, uh, or by the light from the fireplace. It was a little community of its own. They lived among their relatives. They had often their church right handy. The grave graveyard was not too far. The, the boss of the plantation would keep peace where, where trouble started, you understand? He'd automatically call the sheriff or whatever it was necessary and bail them out of jail, uh, get the lawyer to defend them, call the doctor. All this was true before World War II. But all that condition has passed out and faded away. It's gone with the wind. Separated from white society by the unwritten laws of Jim Crow, and the remnants of slave codes, life in the quarters was bounded by the plantation. But external oppression could not stifle the people's humanity. They bonded together for the common good. You were together. It was a family thing. And everybody felt the same way. One gonna do for the other. And it was just so 
you know, the love was so real there. I always felt the warmth of the community. You know, anybody's home we went to, they'd just tell you to come in the house, and, and they'd always ask you, are you hungry? Do you want to eat something? We wanted our children to be the best. And you can't see your child at all times. And help from people means a lot. School took in at 8 o'clock. You leave home at 7.30 and you better be there and you got a mile and a half to walk. And you was going to walk it. When it's out of school, come home. When you're through playing, where well, I tell you to go and play, come home. I don't want you breaking nobody's fruit off the tree. I don't want you throwing any rocks at never anything around anybody's home. I don't want you picking no fights. See, I did send you to the store and say, come right back. They meant come right back. They meant don't stop and talk to nobody. I mean, go to that store. <laughs> you better hit it on back home. My auntie and him used to spit on the porch. In the sun, you had a mile and a half to walk. You better not let that spit dry. If that spit dry, honey, you was in for it. One thing, the intention was to, 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 to prepare you to be able to survive. You know, that, it, that's, that's what the whole attitude of the older people teach you how to survive. Survival in the segregated South meant knowing the codes of behavior that governed whites and blacks. The adults of Sherry Quarters knew the codes and taught them to their children. Sometimes the lessons were backed up by the strap. That was less painful than running afoul of the law. I'm not saying that to us that well, but I stayed out of jail. I now stayed out of jail. Uh, EJ has stayed out of jail. I don't think any of us that really got a whipping got in as much trouble as the one that didn't. These were the people who owned you. These are the people who owned the place, and you worked for them. And there were decent ones among them, and there were those who were not decent among them. And you had to deal with them all. So it was a place of power. It was a place of control. Uh, uh, it's not only this place here. Yeah, any uh, any uh, big house or plantation house at that time. My grandmother was sort of like a conduit between that and the quarters, you know. She would say, okay, be cool on things, or be calm, and don't, don't do certain sort of things. Don't be bad, it was what she used to say. Gaines's maternal grandmother, Julia McVeigh, known as Zuma, was the cook for the white owners at the big house. His paternal grandfather was the carpenter and handyman. But the most important person to young E.J. was his mother's aunt, Miss Augustine Jefferson. She cared for E.J. and his brothers and sister while their parents worked in the fields. She was crippled all her life. She must have been in her um, 40s when I uh, knew her. She'd crawl over the floor, over that porch. She'd crawl down the, um, the um, steps to go into the garden. Um, she'd work on, uh, uh, among the rows of uh, vegetables, beans, or peas, or tomatoes, or cucumber, whatever we had in the garden. Um, she would crawl across the yard, go into the backyard to pick up a con. She would, uh, she cooked our food. She washed our clothes, we had to bring everything to her. Um, she ironed our clothes. Um, I never heard her, and I'm sure she did, but I never heard her complain once about her condition. My gosh, you know, Ernie and Lionel and Eugene, Norbert and Charles and myself, she would give orders like an army sergeant. You know, this lady wasn't walking around, but she was saying a lot. She was like mama to us. She raised us. Because Aunt Augustine could not go out, the adults in the quarters often gathered at her house to talk. Ernest Gaines traces his ear for dialogue to those days on the porch or in front of the fireplace, listening to their stories. He was always very interested in learning. And if, I guess he, in his mind, he could get more from the older people if, the, uh, if he would be with them. Back there, it was done like uh, the old 
Testament said. You didn't, you didn't write it down. You told the children about it, you know. These old people would talk about whatever happened that day, whatever brought them together that particular day, whether it was a funeral or wedding or whatever. And then, uh, of course, if you talk about a wedding, then a, a, another wedding would come up. Or if you're, talk, if you're talking about a funeral, another funeral uh, in the past would, uh, uh, would come up. And uh, they would t start talking that way. And you can sit down and get a, uh, a lesson in history if you just sat there long enough. At least history about this place. Talk was gold in the hot, dusty world of the quarters, but work and the seasons that governed it was the center of all their lives, even the children. Child labor was common in plantation society, but River Lake was different in one respect. P.C. Major brought teachers to the quarters so the children could learn to read and write. When they were not working in the fields, they attended school in the church. For five months out of the year, for about six months out of the year, this would be uh, school. And uh, we didn't have desk or anything in this, uh, uh, in this church. We, all, we sat on the pews uh, in order to write uh, or study our letter lesson. We had to study from uh, having the book or the paper on our laps. Sometimes we'd get on our knees and, um, and uh, kneel down with the paper or the book on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the bench in order to write out your little assignment or whatever you had to do. E.J. learned quickly. Soon he could read and write better than most of the adults in the quarters. The old people often asked him to read aloud from the Sunday comics, the Sears catalog, the Bible. I suppose that's where I got my first education, by, uh, by sitting out there and, uh, on, the, on the porch of the gallery and listen to the old people talk. I also wrote their letters from that, uh, from that gallery, from that porch. I'd sit on the steps while they sat in the chair or sat on the floor and dictated their letters to me. Quite often I had to create the letter because they uh, said after the opening, uh, a couple opening remarks, they, um, you know, they had nothing, they didn't know what else to say. He was learning to make this connection that so many writers never manage between colloquial American regional dialect English and the printed page. I think that's what uh, I try to do in dialogue now and, and in narrative now when I'm <clears throat> from the first person point of view I try to speak uh, as though it's oral rather than uh, something written down but the way the people must have uh, the way certain people spoke, and most of these people here were uneducated people, so uh, I try to get their uh, the rhythm and uh, their little limited vocabulary and diction and whatever they the way they they, they uh, express themselves. When he was about twelve, E.J. was baptized in False River, across the highway from the quarters. Soon after, he began to attend Catholic school in nearby New Roads. At St. Augustine School, E.J. saw a play for the first time. Inspired, he wrote skits and amused people in the quarters by staging little plays at the church. I had this little wedding scene. As a matter of fact, my sister Lois was a little, little uh, bride, a little boys and girls. Yeah. And uh, I, I had them <clears throat> facing the, the audience and with my back to the audience, I was the minister. I was going to marry them. Like that. And neither one knew their lines. So what I had to do, I had to whisper the lines to them. And then they'd, you could see them listen. I'm sure the people in the back could see them listening to what I'm saying to them before they would, before they would speak their lines. And then I had to speak my lines. You know, Do you take so and so? And I say, I do. I do. So He always was the master of doing a lot of writing. We all went to school together, and he loved it to get off to himself. He was among us, but he was a little different with getting off to write little things. E.J. traveled all over the parish with his great aunt, Octavia McVeigh, who sold cosmetics. These trips introduced him to life outside the quarters. They also taught him about the laws of Jim Crow. The example that you can go to a restaurant, you have to go around the back yes, I saw you right and get your sandwich. 
Well, you go to movies, you have to go in another door. Oh, don't Anything go in that Daniel. movie. Oh, uh, children getting on a bus, you have to wait till they all get on and you get on. And if there's any seat to sit down, if not, yeah, you stand up. And there's a, a board put between you and, and, right. and the white person to keep you from being near them, like if you're going to rub off. From the warmth of the quarters to the dangers of the outside world, life in Point Coupee Parish was the raw material for Gaines's art. Using his own memories and the stories handed down by his elders, he would create a world on paper. That's why I would have Miss Jane Pittman working. Uh, Miss Jane would work there, and my grandmother would work. work there. My grandmother would work there. And the first house, as you come into the quarter, when you're with him in the quarters, walking the down the road, the he he mentions and, and he points uh, to the houses and the he said, you know, Aunt so and so uh, lived here, and the, the, my grandmother the, lived the, here, the and. Catherine Carmier's house was between those trees, and Miss Jane Pittman was, was over here. And, all, and as you walk along, real people, characters from the novels, and you realize that this, this is all one world to him. And it, and it just makes the stuff in the books just come to life in, in, in an incredible kind of way. During World War II, E.J.'s father, Manuel Gaines, was sent overseas by the U.S. Army. After Manuel returned to the plantation, he and Adrienne separated, and she moved to New Orleans to work, leaving her children with Aunt Augustine. Adrienne later remarried and moved to California with her new husband, Norbert Collar, a member of the Merchant Marine. I wanted to come here so I could start a life and make a life for my children and bring them and they would. But to finish being raised here and go to school and college and get a trade here would be choice. And I know if I'd have stayed there, they wouldn't have got it. His family understood early that he was the gifted child, that he was the special one, and they helped make opportunities for him to grow. In 1948, E.J. finished the eighth grade at St. Augustine School for Black Children. A few months later, his train ticket to California arrived. He was 15 years old and his mother felt it was time for him to leave Louisiana. He would speak to the others first, the ones who had brought the food, those for whom he had run errands as long back as he could remember, read their letters for them because they could not read, wrote their letters for them because they could not write or shame for not being able to articulate their feelings. They were quiet today more than usual, they nodded instead of speaking. They did not say goodbye, take care, learn. They'd said all of that already. And because they had always put such trust in him, they knew he would always remember that. Then he turned to his aunt. She sat on the floor in the door, as she always did, when she had company at the house in summer. In winter, she sat on the floor by the fireplace. I'm going, he said. We didn't want no, nobody to leave. That's just youngsters. We didn't want nobody to leave. But he's going to go to school, so he's here. And that was it. He would, uh, that would come up, you know what I mean? He was going to go even if he uh, had to uh, work and then go to school. He was going to complete his education. And uh, he'd done just that. It, it brought tears to uh, many people's eyes when he left to get on that bus to go because he had never been no further than New Roads or maybe New Orleans, maybe New Orleans. And going there for alone, it did something to us, to all of us. That night we got together on the road and discussed if you're leaving. And where he was at that time, a night riding the bus. We felt lost without Ernie, and we missed him a lot. Had I stayed another five years, I probably could have, I could have been broken. I could have been bitter, as so many of my uh, colleagues, so many of the kids I grew up with were by that age, by the time they grew up. 
The small naval town of Vallejo across the bay from San Francisco opened up a new world for EJ. At Vallejo High School, he ran track and played football. But he missed Aunt Augustine, his sister and brothers, his grandmother and the people of the quarters. Lonely, he hung out on street corners with his friends. But his stepfather, a strong disciplinarian, told him to get off the block. He says, okay, if you, if you stay on that block, you'll get yourself in a lot of trouble because all the sailors and all this, you know, the things that go along in these kind of towns. And uh, so I had a choice of two places. I had a choice of library or I had a choice of YMCA. And I, uh, I went to YMCA and uh, I put on boxing gloves with a guy who knew how to box. And that's another thing I hadn't learned out here. I hadn't learned how to box. Put on this boxing glove. And this guy was good. He was a southpaw, and he hit me, just, just, just numb my, my, my jaw. And I just took those gloves off then, and I just decided to go to the library. I figured they, they wouldn't hit quite as hard there, you know. In his 16 years, E.J. had never been inside a library. The New Roads Library did not admit black people. The only books he had seen in the quarters were the old people's Bibles or his own out-of-date school books. The Carnegie Library in Vallejo was a place he could not have imagined in Louisiana. Now, everywhere he looked, there were books, two floors of books. He could lose himself between stacks, and no one would interfere with him all day. He began to read indiscriminately at first. It did not matter the subject as long as he was reading something, anatomy or biology or history or art, music. He would open a book, read a page or two, return the book to its shelf, and select another. Then he discovered the fiction section on the second floor. He walked between the stacks, reading title and passing his hand over the spine of the book cover. Aisle after aisle, he would stop a moment, move on, stop a moment, and move on again. Homesick, E.J. looked for books about the South, about people who worked the land, about trees, rivers, dirt roads. He devoured the works of John Steinbeck, Willa Cather, Guy de Maupassant, Tolstoy, Turgenev. The work of black writers was largely unavailable in libraries then, even in California. And white writers didn't portray the truth of their black characters. E.J. wanted to see the people he knew, to hear their voices. He decided to write his own book. I just lied on the floor. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a desk or anything, so. And we had a little baby, Michael, and um, my mother had a little baby. And um, I would, you know, look after Michael and uh, just lie there and try to write. Well, I was writing with long hand, you know. And so the old man used to think I was crazy. He had a thick Creole accent, too. That boy gone crazy right there in front of everybody. And I said, oh, I'm not really crazy. My mother wasn't, didn't care one way or the other, I suppose. She just. Oh yes, my mother did rent me a typewriter. I, after I'd written my what I thought was a novel in longhand, I got her to rent me a typewriter. I didn't know anything about the sitting margin. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. I typed on both sides of the papers. I cut the paper in half because that's the size of a book. I did all that. You know, all this. Every mistake that you could possibly make, I made them doubly. And uh, eventually, I would send this thing to uh, to New York and. Of course, they sent it back. And, uh, I burned it in the incinerator in the backyard. Discouraged, E.J. took a break from writing. He graduated from high school in 1951, then attended Vallejo Junior College. Drafted into the U.S. Army, he served for two years on Guam. There, he tried writing again and won prizes in a couple of short story contests. After that, he went to service and came back and just kept on with his, on his writing on his mind. I know it had to be his very determined to do that. He was determined was to be a writer. With money from the GI Bill, Gaines enrolled at San Francisco State College. Under such teachers as novelist Mark Harris, he studied the classics of literature. But Gaines struggled to write essays, and his compositions earned terrible grades. His teachers agreed to let him write short stories instead, and his grades improved. In 1956, the Campus Literary Magazine published one of his stories, The Turtles. 
Literary agent Dorothea Oppenheimer read that story and asked to meet the author. She said, whenever you have written something, let me see it. And no one else said that. Uh, of course, at San Francisco State, uh, my uh, instructor saw uh, one or two little stories. At Stanford, they saw the same thing. But after that, uh, there was no one to say, okay, whatever you have a right, let me see it, regardless to whether it's a novel or a short story, regardless of the length or whatever it is. And uh, I think it's the greatest thing that can happen to uh, a, a, a young writer. That day, the aspiring Louisiana writer and the sophisticated German expatriate began a relationship that would last for 31 years until Oppenheimer's death in 1987. More than just an agent, she was Gaines's friend and teacher. With her encouragement and sometimes financial support, he continued to write. In 1957, Gaines graduated from San Francisco State and won a fellowship to study writing at Stanford University. There he honed his craft under such teachers as Wallace Stegner. In the late 50s, the beat movement brought new excitement to the Bay Area. Gaines began collecting the jazz and blues records that would later influence the rhythm of his prose. When he left Stanford, Gaines set a deadline. He gave himself 10 years to make it as a writer. Yeah, I know he did tell me I will be a writer. I will not, I'm gonna try or anything like that. I'll be a writer. As a struggling writer, Gaines lived in a one-room apartment with no telephone and a Murphy bed that pulled down from the wall. He ate hot dogs and canned pork and beans or went across the street for dinner with his grandmother who had left Louisiana in the 1950s. Gaines took a series of part-time jobs, dishwasher, mailroom clerk, printer's devil, postal worker, but he always found time to write. Go without shoes, you know, go without cars, go without telephone, go without uh, uh, an automobile, go without color television, go without anything until you can, uh, if, if you want to be a writer, until you can become a success, until you can do things. And uh, once you made that decision, that this is what I will sacrifice to become a writer, you will not let anyone in the world tell you how to write. Gaines sat at his tiny kitchen table writing for six, eight, 12 hours a day. Between 1958 and 1963, he published short stories that recalled his plantation childhood, but also reflected the growing unrest of the civil rights era. One of those stories, The Sky is Gray, has been reprinted in dozens of anthologies. The character of the mother in that story and the character of the little boy um, are among the most vivid creations in all of 20th century American fiction. I mean, uh, it's just extraordinary. You know, I, I will always think of this, this young boy with the toothache, you know, and the cold and, you know, it's, it's really, I mean, he, he's fra he phrases it as trying to be a man, you know, but it's more than that, it's, it's trying to maintain your dignity in a situation in which you're in pain, in such pain that, you know, it's hard to just maintain your correct posture, let alone your dignity. Jane, turn that collar right back down. Not a bomb. You're a man. That, in essence, is, I think, one of the major themes in, in Gaines's text. It is about the necessity of the African American male within the 20th century context to be a man. But anybody, any time, it seems to me maybe a hundred years from now, who picks up the skies gray and reads it, will have a rather powerful experience because it's, it's the, the honesty, the experience that Ernest Gaines himself has had had. He's, he's writing out of his own experience. Gaines concentrated on short stories until an editor told him there was no money in them. He remembered the book he had written at 16. Gaines reread Turgenev 
one of the Russian writers he had discovered in the library, and used the novel Fathers and Sons as a model for his scenes of country life. But like all young writers, Gaines wanted to find the voice that was truly unique, his own. During that time, uh, many of my uh, friends and colleagues were, uh, you know, leaving, leaving the country. They were going to uh, Europe, and they were going to uh, Africa, and they were going to uh, uh, South America, Mexico. And uh, I was supposed to go along, with, I was supposed to go that summer with, uh, join some friends of mine who had already gone to Mexico. James H. Meredith is formally enrolled at the University of Mississippi, ending one chapter in the federal government's efforts to desegregate the university. The town of in the fall of 1962, the nation watched another young man from the South display grace under pressure. Across the country in San Francisco, Ernest Gaines was moved by his courage. After he went there and I was trying to write about the South, I was trying to write Catherine Carmier at that time, and I've been trying to write that book for the last, uh, oh, I suppose, three, four years, three years. Uh, I realized now that I had to go there, I had to go back to Louisiana to really be able to write the book. Uh, had he not gone to the Ole Miss, I may not have gone back to, uh, to Louisiana at that time. One cannot run away from one's uh, work. Uh, one must face one's work if he's going to write seriously and do anything worthwhile. He must have a look at directly in the face. And it was the greatest. I know, it's the, I know now that it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me at that particular time in my writing career. The first six months of 1963 were a spiritual and artistic turning point for Gaines. He returned to Louisiana, to his roots. He wanted to get in touch with his past, to hear those voices again. He visited the plantation often and realized that the life there had changed drastically in the 15 years since he had left. The Cajuns had taken over the good farmland, squeezing out the blacks. At River Lake Plantation, the surviving sons of P.C. Major had died, breaking the bond that held the people of Sherry Quarters together. That's when the quarters really start falling apart because uh, everybody was lost like a, a sheep without shepherds. Uh, nobody knew what to do, so the quarters started falling apart after Mr. Jones died. And after Mr. Jones died, well, that was the end of it. Uh, the quarters just fell completely apart. I think for Gaines, what's at stake is this loss of stability of a community, of a way of life that he knows that had a great deal of value, even if the value for especially the black characters is essentially forged in oppression. Their ability to transcend that, to create things that are a beauty of stability, of love, of community, um, those things are important to him. And some of those things get lost in the change. After Gaines returned to San Francisco in the summer of 63, he finally finished the novel that he had been trying to write since he was 16. Catherine Carmier was published in 1964. I started every year then to go uh, uh, back, at least and sometimes twice a year, most time twice a year, after, uh, after this, after, uh, I think after 65. And uh, each time I went back, I realized that I was, uh, as Hemingway would say, refilling the well. I was getting more and more out of it. To put into my books. He did not like the way he was feeling. He was feeling empty. He did not like being empty, unable to recognize things, unable to associate himself with things. He did not like being unable to recognize the graves. He did not like being unable to associate with the people. He did not like being unable to go to the church with his aunt, or to drink in the side room with brother, what then? Was it to be there? No, that was not it either. If neither here, nor there, nor the living, nor the dead, then what? I think one of the things that Gaines makes awfully clear to most of us is that um, there is a pain and loss in the process of education, especially when children are educated beyond that of their parents and grandparents. There, there is a gap 
there is a kind of divide between them, and it's always painful. In 1967, Gaines met his self-imposed 10-year deadline to make it as a writer when he earned critical praise for his second novel, Of Love and Dust. The book was inspired by Lightning Hopkins' blues song, coupled with Gaines's recollection of a barroom brawl in Louisiana. The plot centered on two interracial love affairs. Gaines looked at a complicated social hierarchy and the consequences of breaking unwritten rules. When I was a, a youngster in the quarters, I knew that everybody in every family wasn't the same. Because you'd have a family with some extremely uh, black complected people and then here's one child who is very fair complected, you know. So you knew there was a lot of interchange going on between whites and blacks in the community. So it wasn't a situation where everything was sterile. The story was very realistic to me, you know. Um, I probably got more excitement out of that book than I did the other ones. It wasn't too long after Pauline went to the big house that Aunt Caroline started warning Paul Bully about his eyes and his tongue. She would never say, mind your business. She would never say, bring your eyes back to where they belong or stop up your ears. She would only say two words, Mr. Grant. And Paul Bully understood exactly what those two words meant. It had started the first night that Bon Bon came to the house. It was summer, just like it was now, and he had tied the horse at the gate and walked toward the house, just like it was his own. He had not said anything to Aunt Caroline or Paul Bully. He said something softly to Pauline, who had been sitting in a chair by the door, and she followed him inside. They had talked a few minutes, then they'd gotten on the bed. Anybody who ever slept on a corn chuck mattress don't have to be told the noise one can make, Aunt Caroline said. And Pauline's morning around there didn't pacify matters at all. Good Lord, Paul Bully said, what the world he got there. Mr. Grant, Aunt Caroline said warningly. After a while, Bonbon bon came out got on the horse and rode away. A few minutes later, Pauline came back out on the gallery. And Aunt Caroline and Paul Bully pretended they hadn't been listening to anything at all. A father up the quarter, the people were singing in the church. Ain't that cop doing the leading? Paul Bully asked Aunt Caroline. Sounds like his voice, Aunt Caroline said. She listened to the singing a while. That's Cobb, she said. Who else got a heavy voice like that? You know, his, his work is not full of lynchings and tortures and whippings and, and murders. Uh, when some of these things have happened, they're not the main stuff that, that gets focused on. It is the ordinary miseries and suffering and joys and loves and achievement of, of, of ordinary, plain people that usually don't get a voice in literature. In 1968, Gaines published five short stories in a collection called Bloodline. His central characters range from a six-year-old boy to an elderly woman. The stories deal with serious issues, manhood, civil rights, survival with dignity, racial separation. At the same time, they are full of humor that captures the half-tragic, half-comic nature of life in the segregated South. Those stories in, in Bloodline that he, he conceived after this period of intense dedication to his work, and they suddenly come out in such a beautiful way. In my mind, he immediately became comfortable with somebody like Eudora Welty, that kind of artistic skill that she, and feeling that she has, depth of feeling. For someone like a Faulkner, and certainly a Eudora Welty, and uh, Catherine Ann Porter, um, 20th century white Southern authors who certainly relied very much upon memory, um, the necessity of, of remembering, and out of that remembering telling, um, we have, I think, correspondences uh, in the fiction of Ernest Gaines. My mistress was standing on the gallery watching the dust rising over the field and just crying, sweet precious blood of South, sweet precious blood of the South just watching the dust, wringing her hands and crying. Then she saw me stand there looking up at her. In his first three books, Gaines established his style and revealed a masterful sense of place. 
He created wonderful characters, men, women, and children with distinctive and memorable voices. But no other voice created by Ernest Gaines speaks to his readers yes. like that of Miss Jane Pittman. My mistress told him and stopped standing there and gave him, go out there in the road and give the troops some water. I... Gaines had often delved into the past. Now he went even further back. To get the history right, he spent two years researching slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Huey Long, World War II, and the Civil Rights Movement. He read slave narratives and studied photographs of former slaves. He has done his homework in real life and in the archives. And he, he only gives the appearance of just writing down naturally and simply what people say. When the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman was published in 1971, the book was hailed as a masterpiece, nominated for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Some critics saw the book as a condensed history of African-American life, but to Gaines, Miss Jane was first and last an individual, modeling her partly on his Aunt Augustine and the women who gathered on her porch he captured her voice so well that some reviewers mistakenly assumed she was a real person. Now that is the art that conceals art for sure. That book is the equivalent of a really huge, beautiful, massive, gigantic tree. That's what that book is like. There's an old oak tree up the quarters where Aunt Lou Bolin and them used to stay. That tree has been here, I'm sure, since this place been here, and it has seen much, much, and it knows much, much. And I'm not ashamed to say I've talked to it, and I'm not crazy either. It's not necessary craziness when you talk to trees and rivers, but it's a different thing when you talk to ditches and bayous. A ditch ain't nothing, and a bayou ain't too much either. But rivers and trees, unless of course it's a china ball tree. Anybody caught talking to a china ball tree or a thorn tree got to be crazy. But when you talk to an oak tree that's been here all these years and, and knows more than you'll ever know, <laughs> it's not craziness. It's just the nobility you respect. Is Jane Pittman always, as you write, at a subconscious level, is that, uh, uh, has Jane Pittman become uh, something to which you'll strive as long as you write, that is, to, to create other people and bring them to life? I think one of the reasons why the, the, my last book, uh, In My Father's House, did not do uh, nearly as well uh, is because um, uh, I think people wanted another Miss Jane, you know, Miss Jane Pittman Rides Again type thing, yes. you know, or, you know, the daughter of Miss Jane Pittman, that yes. sort of thing. And, um, I just can't do it anymore. I try to write as well as I can each time that I sit down and I think I, I do a little better each time. Gaines was always concerned with how the racial past affected the complex relationships between fathers and sons. In My Father's House was a book he felt he had to write. He struggled with it for seven years. In 1978, he published the novel about Philip Martin, a small town civil rights leader and the abandoned son who returns to haunt him. Philip took a deep breath and he stood up. He was real tired. He held on to the back of the chair while he looked down at Chippo. I was telling my boy today that what kept us apart is a paralysis that we inherited from slavery. Paralysis kept me on that bed that day he knocked on the door. Paralysis kept me on that floor Saturday when I should have got up and told the people who he was. I thought 15 years ago when I found religion, I had overthrown my paralysis. But it's still there. How are you going to get rid of it? How are you going to shake it off? Critical reaction to In My Father's House was mixed, but Gaines had raised provocative questions about manhood and the political impotence of black men in America. My 
entrance gone south. In 1983, Gaines again used the plantation quarters as his setting. His novel, A Gathering of Old Men, gives voice to a dozen elderly characters who take a stand after a lifetime of abuse. If a black stood in the 40s in Louisiana, there were ways to say he was a awful a bad nigga and uh, it, it was easy if it was just you know he would he would he would have to confront law or or the outlaws if he stood at that particular time it could easily be it could have been his uh owner of the place where he lived uh the clans or uh, the sheriff or the police or whoever if he stood up at that time and many blacks who did stand up had to leave during the night, had to leave. My great-grandfather had to leave during the night because he stood. Set in the late 1970s, the story is told in multiple voices, a technique Gaines had learned from Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. In remembering the old days and the indignities they suffered, the old men used communal storytelling as both lament and celebration. Like now, they're trying to get rid of all proof that black people ever farmed this land with plows and mules. Like if they had nothing from the start but them motor machines. Sure, one day they will get rid of the proof that we ever was, but they ain't going to do it while I'm still here. Mom and Papa worked too hard in these fields. They Mama and they Papa worked too hard in these same fields. They mama and they papa people work too hard, too hard to have that tractor just come in that graveyard and destroy all proof that they ever was. In the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, Gaines honored the women of the plantation who had shown him love and kindness. In a gathering of old men, he paid homage to the men he had spent hours talking to on his trips back home. Uh, one man I know was Zeno, uh, Walter Zeno Sr. I mean, uh, he was a man, who at that time we called a man among men because, uh, you know, he, he didn't, uh, in other words, nobody uh, said ordered him around too much. During that time, Salute, uh, Joey Bat, uh, George Williams, uh, Jimmy Brooks. Faulkner says, you know, how do you write? Faulkner said, I listen to the voices. And he, he listened to them all the time, both literally, uh, people he knew and so on, but, and, but also in his own privacy. He's still hearing the voices, and that's how he wrote his stories. And I think uh, uh, Ernest Gaines has that, you see. He listens to the voices. For, for most of us writing out of the South, we just are held spellbound by the language of the people. By mining the past for subject matter, Gaines offended some critics who charged that it was irrelevant to contemporary issues. Others praised him for seeing that the past was very much alive in the present. My early years of writing, there were people who told me I should not write about this kind of life, that this kind of thing should be forgotten. But what other life did I have? Once she and my aunt had found their places, two rows behind the table where he sat with his court-appointed attorney, his godmother became as or immobile as a great stone or as one of our oak or cypress stumps is immobile. She never Gaines returns to the late 1940s in his most recent novel, A Lesson Before Dying. It is not that I'm, I'm trying to go back to the 40s after writing about the 70s, but that it is a story that uh, or something that I need to, I, I feel that I need to write about. The story is told by a teacher who struggles with his most challenging student, a young man sentenced to die for a crime he did not commit. The judge told Jefferson that he had been found guilty of the charges brought against him and that he, had, he saw no reason that Jefferson should not pay for the part he played in the horrible crime, death by electrocution. The, the governor would set the date. <laughs> because I live here in San Francisco, and San Quentin is not very far from here. And ever since I've been here, I have heard about and read about and heard over the news radio about people being executed in the, in the, the gas chamber over there in San, uh, in San Quentin. And uh, I've always wondered, how does it feel to know that on Tuesday at 10 o'clock you're going to die? 
be put to death. And it's one of those things that have haunted me all my life. And uh, I've seen myself uh, being walk into this thing. I've seen myself go walk into the gas chamber, to the electric chair. And it's a, a theme that I play with uh, on all everything I write, and that is manliness and what is manliness and how does one face anything. Uh, it's a theme that I, that is in you know so much of my work, so many of the novels and the short stories as well. Since 1983, Gaines has been professor of creative writing at the University of Southwestern Louisiana in Lafayette. He lives in a pleasant neighborhood in a house donated by fans of his work. In a sense, he has come home again. But Gaines still considers California home. He still keeps a flat on Divisadero Street on the same block where he's lived since 1963. Sitting at his desk overlooking downtown San Francisco, he continues to write his Louisiana stories. He once said to me, if I ever get it exactly right to suit me, I might move on to some other subject, but it doesn't satisfy me, yet I haven't exhausted this, this quest. And the last one left, I have to see that the grave stayed for a little while longer. But I just didn't do it for my own people. I did it for every last one buried back there under them trees. And I did it for every four o'clock and every rose bush and every palm of Christian that ever grew.